Thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Anya. I'm going to spend maybe 20, 25 minutes going through what has changed since we last spoke, as I see it, and what our options are uh, looking forward. As I said in Mandela a couple of years ago, one man, and he lives in Mullingar, had the power to disconnect our island, to turn off the tap of tourism. I didn't expect then, as nobody did, that it would be a virus that would turn off the tap of tourism. None of these tourism presentations are the same without a few boring slides to look at, but I'm just going to throw a few at them. It's from Eurostat. It's the change since January 2020 in the household expectations uh, in the economy. You can see that we're, ours fell 47% in April 2020, right at the start of the first lockdown. And you can see Sweden uh, working away, you know, higher than us. So all started around much the same, a little bit higher than us all the way through, quite controversial their approach. Whereas Germany, we they were above us for most of it, then went below us again. So look at the number of work days lost. 163 days of workplaces closed, and that's out of date, that's up to February. Um, it shows we're way ahead of everyone else in Europe. It shows we're way ahead of Italy, Netherlands, Britain, uh, Belgium, and uh, Germany down there at 34. Germany would be held up as one who manages the crisis uh, in a less panic-stricken way than most other countries. Bulgaria right there at the bottom. Our savings rate, this is really important. This is our pent-up demand, our famous pent-up demand, the outbound travel and inbound, inbound uh, tourism both look to this there's going to be a lot of spend our savings rate soared to 35 percent the second quarter of 2020 um, sweden saw little fluctuation and german households um, savings rate always traditionally higher than ireland um, and it uh, dropped a little bit along the way that's our infections. Nobody needs any introduction to that. That's the seven day average. We'll have a look at the 14 day average a little bit later in the presentation. And that uh, flew up January, 100,000 cases at the beginning of January, 200,000 cases four weeks later. Quite horrific and a panic stricken uh, reaction to that, which turned on international travel in general. We'll come back to that in a second spectrum. And here is where we stand in terms of tourism. Uh, only Greece, Cyprus and Malta have more employed in non-financial, of the proportion in non-financial business employed in tourism. We're ahead of Austria, Spain, Croatia, Britain ahead of Portugal, which always surprises me in Italy, everybody else below 10%. There, the, uh, the scale of the impact in a couple of figures, I don't think anyone needs any introduction to that from their own personal experience. And how have the sectors responded to it? Aviation sector, very robust. People would have heard Michael O'Leary, Eddie Wilson saying uh, to the government, get your house in order, get your vaccines rolled out. We're ready to return to the sky. O'Leary's been doing something interesting. He's been keeping his pilot certified. If your pilot is furlocked, uh, he has to go back into a simulator. And Michael O'Leary's been keeping them uh, a couple of landings, a couple of takeoffs. Um, to keep them within their licensing. He's also been keeping the aircraft certified so that they won't have to go back for the series of checks. It's a very safety specific industry and we could see a bit of a traffic jam. Let's say there is a return, sudden return to the skies. Um, Air France, Lufthansa, British Airways, all these people with a big queue of aircraft to get them recertified again. And it's very expensive and cost uh, several hundred thousand to recertify an A380, for instance. That's why most of them are parked up. Um, so Ryanair are going to be in the position to move quickly. Two strong airlines, Ryanair and Aer Lingus, don't need financial aid. The most people will be familiar with that. It's been pointed out that uh, France, Germany, Switzerland, uh, Spain even and all of the other European countries have bailing out air, airlines to the extent of three or four billion smaller airlines than Ryanair in a lot of the cases. We, the Irish government, isn't being called on one loan for 150 million specific to Aer Lingus. Aer Lingus is a different uh, bird, is that the right word, than it was when we entered the crisis last um, March, April, when we had an Irish-born CEO of IAG and we had obviously an Irish born uh, CEO of Aer Lingus. Now Sean has gone to be CEO of British Airways. We now have a Spanish born CEO of IAG and a British uh, English born uh, CEO of Aer Lingus. 
that um, sounds a little bit more scary than it is. Aer Lingus aren't going anywhere. Their brand is so strong in Ireland. They're a really strong brand. Very strong in America as well. One of, you know, I always instance, they're one of only two brands, Irish brands, to have been mentioned on the hit show The Simpsons over the years. But what they, it does mean is the expansion might, they might be looking elsewhere, particularly if we have a government who is not interested in connectivity. What will happen is that you know the new aircraft that are arriving, the A320 uh, LR, which I talked about in Mondello, it's really important because there are 100 fewer seats to sell. 100 fewer seats to sell means routes are viable that would not otherwise be viable. That means the likes of Minneapolis uh, came onto the Dublin departure board. Uh, Manchester has had um, a, a bit of a turnaround obviously when traffic fell virgin pulled out a lot of the charters pulled out still hadn't uh, quite recovered from the loss of thomas cook a couple of years ago so what uh, manchester did was went to Aer Lingus and they were moving air forward their aircraft there uh, at one, one stage and i'm not sure if it's still true it looked like the flagship of the fleet st patrick might actually be based out of manchester so a couple of a330s and 320s will be going there so what that means is that the opportunities that were there for particularly Shannon and Dublin um, will probably be seen as available to other airports. Edinburgh are also smelling around Aer Lingus in the hope of getting some of their aircrafts. Uh, it means that we'll still have our traditional New York, Chicago, Boston. But the exciting new stuff, the great excitement of getting a, a new route to Seattle, for instance, um, will we see less of that? Will we see that happening in Spanish and English airports in the future and not in Ireland? Remember, it's a Spanish-owned company now, Aer Lingus. And these routes take hard work. You take an example, the uh, Toronto route for Shannon. Um, that was up against, uh, from Air Canada, that was up against serious competition. There were six other uh, airports looking for that, six other tourist boards. Uh, Las Vegas, for instance, were in there. Uh, they can do three rotations from Toronto to Las Vegas every day, whereas you can only really do one, um, t Shannon one. Um, it does release the aircraft a little bit earlier than any other transatlantic aircraft. But if Shannon won that debate, won that argument, and there are all those arguments that were won, that are serious, there are some people in the room who know all about how hard it is to market something when you're on the fringes. All of that hard work could be undone on connectivity, Connectivity is in trouble. Um, the European um, a Aviation Controllers, uh, Eurocontrol, another Irish guy, the, the Irish do aviation very well, Eamon Brennan, in charge of that. He uh, says that Ireland is the most disconnected of the 40 countries across Eurocontrol from 2019 to 2021. We did most to dismantle our aviation product. And that is, suggests that we were worse hit by the virus than anyone else. We weren't. We just reacted in a different way. We reacted in a particular negative way, which brings us to the narrative. Won't spend a lot of time on this. Travel was where they turned. The international travel, cases related to international travel since uh, the start of the pandemic, they're the total of 1,014 reported weekly. It'll be a new report, I think, this week, but that's up to last week out of 220,000. At any stage, they generally run around 9, 10, 11. They um, less than a small proportion of 1% of all infected cases uh, coming from travel, international travel. At, uh, the, if it goes up beyond 20 or 25 and the num overall numbers come down, it can go up to a quarter of 1%. Uh, across Europe, less than 1% is what's been happening. It's not just our figures that are showing that. But the narrative has been that somehow two, two strands, really. One, that um, disconnecting will keep new variants at bay. And the second one is that uh, it's not what Gabriel Scully's group are saying, but they leave the conjecture for people that it will magic away our existing problems. We all get our own lives back if everybody arriving in the country is put into detention. And this week, the government has introduced, introduced a bill to provide for mandatory quarantine hotels for travellers arriving in Ireland. And once this notion that we get our own lives back has been implanted in people's minds, uh, it takes legs. Uh, people will be familiar with what happened. The unfortunate couple who decided that they were going to cocoon in Lanzarote and not in Ireland. But if people want to go on a bus to the airport, 
and go on a holiday and say that that's okay. And when we thought the Lanzarote narrative was running out of legs, here comes the Tenerife narrative. Hello, how are you? Can you come over here, please? Have you got a copy of the medical appointment? What time is your appointment tomorrow? What makes some of this extraordinary is that there are only five flights a week. There would be more than that a day to the three main Canary Islands we go in to winter. Um, there are Tenerife, Lanzarote, Gran Canaria. The number of uh, flights out of Dublin Airport is not down yet to the level it was last April. We were down to about 12 outbound a day in April. It's running at about 20 at the moment. It goes a little bit higher at the weekend, but certainly in the grand total of over 100 a week, uh, five are to the Canary Islands, which is our only holiday location. If you look at when the Department of Justice said 60% of people are returning from holidays and you ask for the breakdown of the countries, it's quite revealing. Romania is one of the top ones. You know, I know Constanta Beach is lovely, but the uh, season there is two weeks or three weeks shorter than Bulgaria, further down the Black Sea coast. And Brasov is nice and Brand Castle is good for a visit, but it doesn't compare with Kilki. All of that um, suggests that Romania wouldn't be the most uh, holiday-driven destination, certainly in January. Uh, one of the tour operators, Sunway, launched a program in 2007 to Constanta and lost their shirt, never went back. Uh, another of the big holiday locations we're going to in January is Poland. So quite clearly, uh, the Department of Justice is lumping in the reconnection of families in th with what we would traditionally regard as holiday, which would be uh, the bucket and spade, swimming pool, golf club product. There are two main problems that arise out of this narrative. One of them is that it pushes the airlines to disconnect, even if the government doesn't uh, decree this, it makes the routes less viable. And we come down to close to what is subsistence level. Clearly, uh, tourism isn't um, a major player in the economy. It's very, very important for jobs. It's not very, very important for its contribution to the economy, which is based on, as everyone knows, um, pharmaceutical software and agri-food. Uh, there is an element within the government, I suspect, which says if we can ride this out by paying off the tourism workers, you know, the, the huge number of tourism workers, and keep our three uh, planks of the economy going, then we're fine. And to some extent, the three major pillars of the economy have been doing better in, since the lockdown than they were before. It's actually been good for some of them. The real problem is when you're so um, dependent on FDI, connectivity can come down to a level where it starts harming those three pillar industries. The second problem with that narrative is it makes it very difficult for a politician to change it. Um, you get barbecued on Twitter if you decide uh, to end a situation such as hotel quarantine and the cases start going up. We had a case uh, on QR17 last June where one person, an Iraqi barber from Sligo, the barber of Sligo is like a, uh, an opera, um, is uh, said to have infected 60 people. Uh, the case was made uh, mentions uh, at press conferences and has you know been used to reheat the media story since uh, the same case. So it does all this contributes to the notion that uh, Ireland's problem, our COVID problem, is through due to the importation of cases when the figures show otherwise. That's not just a problem for us in tourism or me in the media. That's a problem for politicians, and makes it much, the decision making process is weighed down by this prospect that people will get hugely angry if you do anything to restart reconnecting our island with the rest of the world. And reconnection is vital to what we all do. Um, home holidays will you know, contribute in a good year 25% of the overall revenue. We had a short season last year which fell unevenly. Some, uh, some sectors uh, like self-catering, like the boat hire, the Shannon, people like that, uh, got some a semblance of a season out of it. Nobody got a full season. But we are now facing um, the prospect that the home holiday season is equally difficult to manage because of the whack-a-mole approach. We saw Donegal, at least they got 72 hours, much more than Kildare got. But Donegal going into lockdown during the season last year, uh, what happens if the sort of the big performers in last year, Galway, Dingle, places like that, go into lockdown? We're now going to run into a raft of 
uh, problems with uh, people unable to move and seeking refunds and the people, the businesses who have opened and gone to that expense because it is a big decision. Do I hire the staff? Do I go to pay for the extra measures? All of that um, will, you know, facing a whack-a-mole existence up it pops it gets pop it gets hit on the head with a two-week lockdown back down again nobody can plan a family holiday nobody can plan a business activity with that sort of uncertainty how has tourism responded interestingly enough fault ireland and tourism ireland have always not been quite at war but there's been a great deal of suspicion between them over the years. Tourism Ireland had the glamorous international marketing job. Falch Ireland did the sort of the belt and braces. We had extraordinary situations like Falch Ireland arriving at ITB Berlin, which should have been held this month uh, when they uh, brought out their, put up their own stand a couple of years ago. But Falch Ireland are now the key, they, they have the keys to the kingdom, uh, they're identified by the government as, first of all, as the means, the channel of communication to the tourism and hospitality industries. And they did a terrific job. Jenny the Soul was working to, you know, sometimes ambiguous Department of Health uh, regulations. We all know the problems when you start looking at the detail of the of the, the red restrictions which are brought in at very short notice and um, channeling that then down to the hospitality industry, uh, putting the directives in place, putting the scheme in place where we had, you know, the COVID friendly signs and businesses, all of that very successful. But it has meant that um, their, their, their power has been uh, extended way beyond what, uh, we, what it was at the start of this crisis. And there are the politics of Irish tourism are such that um, when you've got uh, your relationship at Falch Ireland always took on a certain importance. It's taken on even more importance at this stage. They are the keepers of the kingdom and they have the money, they have the backing, they have the 55 million in grant aid. Uh, how that's dispersed, it's really going to be based on those relationships. So while um, you know we had alternatives, you could sort of bypass Falch Ireland in the past and a lot of businesses could. They're, now more powerful than they have ever been in the history of Irish tourism and that's going back even to the 60s when we had well, fewer than 2 million visitors coming to the island every year and international marketing was in their hands. So there are all the questions So, on what are the answers? When do we start marketing again? When do we see a return to the skies again? We're lucky that we will have the routes in place as soon as the European average comes down and the vaccine and the so-called international vaccine passport which um, you know we've seen the first uh, first signs of that IATA very enthusiastic about it Emirates have implemented it Ryanair updated their app last week to allow you to scan in your evidence of your PCR test or your vaccine cert and all the aviation industry side of it is moving at European level Ursula van der Leyen is optimistic, overly optimistic, in my view, of getting things through for a, in about a month. It's then down to national governments because we've seen uh, national governments taking control of this from uh, mid-March when Italy was effectively thrown under the bus last year. Um, but the national policy is what's determining it. Most countries, and it's hard to tell that because the shrillness of the debate in Ireland, most countries are less into disconnecting than we are uh, for instance, hotel mandatory quarantine, um, we're the only country doing this. And I suspect the only country, the only reason we're doing it is there's a media sovereignty issue. A lot of people are confused because they watch some of Sky News, who's in charge here? Is it Boris Johnson or is it Micheál Martin? And because Britain brought it in, there was sort of a hue and cry to do so. No other country has done that. Cyprus, uh, Hungary did it, brought it in for um, England, English, almost a reciprocal measure. Cyprus have now uh, decided that a vaccine passport will mean that there won't be mandatory hotel quarantine. Norway has it, but not for Norwegian citizens returning home. And remember, the people going through the airport at the moment, um, we're down to a very, very small proportion, um, some most disconnected country in Europe. Uh, most of those are Irish people returning home. Things like the mandatory quarantine are moving us in the wrong direction. Um, what... What do we do with uh, planting the notion that Kildare is a great county into people's heads? Um, that can be done all the time. And the 
you know, this notion that people are looking at more travel videos than they were before. I'm not exactly sure that uh, that's true, but certainly the product that we market, we could make big decisions uh, on that now. And we could also do things that normally um, we don't have time to think about, uh, time to take the paintbrush, not just to the premises, but also to the entire product, reimagining it uh, quite clear, um, outdoors, wind blowing through your hair, up on the horse or um, out walking in the uh, bogs. They're the sort of product that will try post COVID um, big queues for um, Pirates of the Caribbean and the Orlando Sun or 5,400 people on, an, on a cruise ship are uh, jumping up and down on Temple Bar. That's not the sort of imagery that is going to get people excited for post COVID travel. So all of that is there for us. The timing of it is that most people are saying September is going to be the new January, that we may be open by then with the aviation is ready to jump, whether the government wants them or not, they're ready to jump. The government can regulate that with the 14 day self-isolation and with the uh, mandatory hotel quarantine, which won't make a whit of difference for our case rate, in my opinion. You know, if, if politicians are brave enough to start backing off that disconnect uh, narrative, um, everything can happen fairly quickly. After that, if it doesn't happen, we're now looking into a whole new set of problems. Do people make the expensive decision to open up again, hire staff, put all the extra measures in place that are required uh, under the health legislation for a short season where all your revenue could be eaten up by a sudden lockdown? Our job in this virtual room is to get that tap turned on again. We'll do what we can to do so on the media side and on the lobbying side. And people like Ono Mara Walsh are repeating again and again and again. Um, tourism isn't the biggest uh, contributor to the economy, but it is the huge Im contributor to employment, 270,000 jobs. Listening to Ono Mara Walsh, listening to Ruth Andrews, the big concern is that we will lose capital to the industry, that banks will make it much harder for you to get the loan extensions, the overdraft, and to get the funding that you need, that the personnel will be lost. Hospitality was traditionally an entry level, all, uh, all um, kitchen porters and waiters, but it's now quite a sophisticated industry. And the brains that were driving the, that industry uh, might be looking elsewhere. Um, they're talking about survival, hunkering down, getting what supports they can to get through uh, 2021 and into March 2022. Um, all of the, that remains to pan out. Even a short season will help um, make life easier, but it's certainly going to be 2022 before we can start planning coherently again. And it's our job, uh, everyone in this virtual room, to get that tap that I talked about of international tourism. Remember, 25% uh, of our revenue comes from domestic, 75% from international. Um, it's our job to get that tap turned on again. Research by Tourism Ireland shows people are ready to travel again. UK, um, frightened as we are, Ireland is a market they're familiar with, close to. They'll go close, they'll go familiar. Germany, France, both looking into Ireland uh, as, as a good option for post-COVID travel because of our imagery that West of Ireland, wind through your hair sort of stuff. America, obviously a very, very strong brand. Our two or four um, key markets that we've done all our work in over the last 20 years are the ones that are going to help get us out. It's a big question is when and how that is going to happen. Um, and the real, the, from a government's point of view, not from an industry point of view, from a government point of view, and uh, there seems to be no uh, direction as to what our exit strategy, how that's going to restart, how are we going to restart? I'd like the Tourism Task Force to have done more of that. I was a member of it myself, I can't blame anybody else, um, but it turned it largely into a shopping list of support measures, which is probably what it set out to be um, in the first place. But um, the 2021, not lost, and I'd love to see it returning in big numbers. And the air aviation um, is probably more important than anyone else in this. That's the one thing that's in place. Everything else is uncertain. I hope that was coherent. 
And Anya, with your permission, I'm going to take any questions that members of Kildare Falcha have. As you, as you know, I'm a very proud Lily White, never got to wear the white jersey in Croke Park, um, but I'm happy to do so uh, in the tourism, the fields of tourism, wherever I can. And my email address is owentravel at uh, gmail.com. My phone number is 87 296 If you don't have it, you should. Uh, I'm prepared to respond to any queries at any stage. But over the next few minutes, I'll be able to take queries here. And with your permission, Anya, thank you very much.